Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German World War I A7V Tokenkopf tank. Now unlike many of the other smaller scale builds which are posted on the ECA channel in which those builds are built for private commission and belong to a private collector, the model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these smaller scale build videos, I often take on commission build projects from vehicles ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. As for availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address which is listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now the model that you see here is built mostly out of the box, however it does feature several modifications that were made outside of the original kit. We'll be going over these additions as well as the basic overall kit itself in this video. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. This vehicle here is the German World War I A7V tank. The A7V is significant in that it is the first German tank designed to ever see combat. The story of the A7V goes back to 1916 when the Germans were completely taken by surprise with the introduction of the British tanks that premiered on the Western Front during this time. The concept of an armored vehicle which can navigate through no man's land, impervious to machine gun fire as well as artillery, was definitely something that the Germans took heed of and wanted to catch up with as they saw the British had already developed a vehicle of their own. To head the project, the German War Department put the direction of the vehicle under the designer of Joseph Vollmer. Joseph Vollmer was one of Germany's foremost automobile designers, and he was a very prominent engineer of his day. The vehicle that Vollmer and his staff of engineers designed is the following vehicle. The A7V is very different compared to its British counterparts in many key areas. One of the key differences is the overall exterior shape of the vehicle. Rather than utilizing the rhomboidal shape, which is a staple on British tank designs of this period, the Germans went ahead and went with this very high profile silhouette angled box type design. Also, rather than utilizing the tracks that go all the way around the vehicle and even on the outside, the German tank design keeps the tracks contained inside of the vehicle, more than likely to protect them from any sort of damage that can occur on the battlefield. Another key difference is also the way the suspension is laid out on both of the vehicles. The British tank designs had no suspension. They were a rigid wheeled system and the vehicle would have a very rough ride. As opposed to the German design, which went ahead and utilized many of the design characteristics from the American Holt tractor. The Holt tractor was a commercial offering that was around at the turn of the century, and the Germans had access to these tractors prior to the war. With the Holt, the design was that there are several pontoons that have internal hydraulics that make for a deadening system and gives the vehicle a smoother ride. Another difference between the two designs has to do really more with the philosophy in which they were used. The British went ahead and had two types of variants based on the same chassis. In one version, the vehicle is primarily only armed with machine guns, and the other version would have been armed with artillery pieces and cannons. The Germans went ahead and, rather than going with that route, they simply had one vehicle that had all of these types of armament installed. The A7V utilized six MG08 Maxim pattern water-cooled machine guns, and a single 57 millimeter gun that was mounted in the very nose of the vehicle. Rather than the driver being in the hull of the vehicle all the way up to the front, which is found on the British patterns, the Germans went ahead and had the driver sitting all the way up, up high in a helm in much the same way which was done on ships. In fact, Vollmer utilized many ship concepts when him and his design staff were coming up with this vehicle. 
As for the reason why the Germans went with this very unorthodox design, you have to keep in mind that at this time here, the concept of the tank was completely new and revolutionary. Nobody knew exactly how these things were to be used, nor less how they were going to be designed for their usage. The Germans went ahead and borrowed many things that worked and were in use before, namely that from concepts, again, from the Navy with ships. The British did this on similar basis, however, they went about in a different way. Of course, the major revolutionary design was that from the French, being the FT-17, which pretty much laid the groundwork for just about every single tank that has ever been made past that point and onward to today. The vehicles utilized two Daimler ends, four-cylinder, 200-horsepower engines, and the vehicle's top speed was 4 miles per hour cross country, 9 miles per hour on roads. The vehicle came in at 33 tons and approximately 20 of these tanks were built. The vehicles entered service and were adopted by the Germans in 1918, just shortly before the war's end. The vehicles were used in combat, and combat experience was mixed with the different experiences that these tanks were used in. Some battles were proven to be a little bit better than others. Basically, the same overall experience that the British kind of had when they first started fielding their own tanks back in 1916. The vehicles that were built by the Germans were all scrapped after the war with the exception of one vehicle. That vehicle was captured by the Australian Army and that vehicle is currently on public display today in a military museum in Australia. It is the sole surviving example of an A7V German tank. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplied you with. And here's the model just before the start of the project. As for the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale A7V Totenkopf plastic model kit from the company Toro Models. Toro Models is an Italian based plastic model company. And the tooling of this kit here dates back to about 1980. For anyone who is unaware or unfamiliar with this company, Toro has a very limited range of military model kits. Everywhere from ships to planes, and specifically for the purposes of this video here, their AFV collection. What made Toro kits unique for the time was that they were releasing kits that were off the beaded path compared to the other plastic model companies of the period. For their armor, all of the armor that was released by Toro is that of very early history or early design period of military vehicles. Now, like I said before, this kit here was first released in 1980. However, these kits were in production for a good duration of time. In fact, Toro Models is still around today and their website is still up. However, if you ever go to their website, it looks like something that is right out of the year of 1997. So it's very dated to say the least. However, this kit is still listed in their kit listings. Now, as for this particular kit here, this kit here was actually purchased by my father back in the year 1997. He purchased it from Squadron Mail Order, and this kit here has been sitting in the collection for a very, very long period of time. In fact, this kit here is one of the oldest kits that is found in the stash. My father purchased the kit, and he started to build the model. However, one thing led to another, and the model was never fully completed. He went ahead and put the model back in the box, and back in the stash it went, and it sat there literally since probably the year 1998. So it feels good to actually get this guy out of the stash and get him built finally. Starting with the model's graphic design, the graphic design you see here is basically standard for all the Toro model kits. This includes everything from their AFV line to their aircraft line and even their ship line. As for this particular kit here, of course, it's the A7V Totenkopf. The composition is that of the vehicle driving through some barbed wire. We have here a very stylized Mark IV British tank in the background. 
and has a very painterly relief, I guess you could say, for that of the whole composition as a whole. As for the rest of the graphic design, we have here the Imperial German flag. Of course, being German, you have to have some script typeface that has A7V Talkenkopf. The rest of the graphic design as follows. You have, again, a thumbnail and some features of the kit. Now, what's unique about this particular kit here is that this kit does feature a full interior detailing and something that is very ahead of its time is that of workable individual track links. Keep in mind, this kit here dates back to 1980. At this time here, the norm was to have tanks with the one-piece single vinyl track or you start seeing the development of the cancerous individual static track links, which unfortunately still permeate or permeate through the AFV world today. This model here was one of the first that I know of that actually had the track links that are completely workable. I'll go into that when I crack the box open. As for the rest of the graphic design, we have here the company logo and the name, kit number. And on the reverse side here, we have the other vehicles in the range. Other vehicles is that of another version of the A7V. And two versions of the Italian Fiat 3000, which is really a spin-off of the French FT-7T from Renault. We have a World War I version, as well as a 1930s version, which was more likely used by the Italians in the interwar periods, as well as into the early phases of World War II. I believe more likely this would be for Libya. Now, cracking open the box, we'll show what's on the inside. Alright, like I said before, the kit was partially started, so you have to bear with me on what we have here at present. Starting with the runners, like I said before, the tooling will date back to 1980, and keep in mind, Toro was not exactly a large time outfit. So the tooling is going to be considerably a lot more rougher and primitive compared to the tooling of today, certainly today, but also even within the last 10 or so years. Now, there are some rivets that are present, and the Toro kits are known to have a lot of detail that are found in the moldings. However, the overall quality detail is going to be a lot softer. As for quality level, this, so far from what I've seen from the tooling, it's very similar to the MMP models M50 Israeli Sherman that I did a little while ago. And that video was found on the video listings, and I definitely recommend checking it out, specifically if you're a fan for, of course, these archaic vintage model kit built. As you can see the tank does come with a figure, he has a nice sinkhole on his back and the detailing is not exactly very crisp but I presume is workable. Now the figure will not be utilized for this build but just show you example of the finer the type of fine detailing that is going to be found on this kit as a whole. We have here a bag with the decals in it. Decal sheet looks to be pretty Standard again for the the time, and might may or may not be used on this build. Of course, that is something that may be subject to change. But you do have the basic iron crosses and the skull and crossbones, which are found on these older World War One era vehicles. The instructions out of the way, and here we have the kit itself. Here you can see most of the tanks, hull, and suspension, all pre-built by my father. He was building it with the interior. The interior is very, very simplistic in nature. As you can see, it has some diamond plate for that of the floorboards. We have here a radiator detailing on opposite sides. What looks to be that of the engine, which is mounted centrally in the tank. And we have here an ammo magazine for that of the main gun in the front. And as for this box here, more than likely that of machine gun ammo for that of all the Maxims. Here we can see the detailing found on the rest of the tank. The tank does have all of its riveting present. You can see the detailing on the hatches and the hinges. Now, as for the suspension, the vehicle, in addition to having a workable track system, also has a real spring suspension. The suspension is actually very 
mimicking that of the real one in that the suspension pieces are that in pods, which is actually pretty standard for heavy equipment at the time. Things like bulldozers and cranes have something very similar to this. The A7V has three pontoons with that, that hold all of the wheels, and they are actually sprung on small little springs. Now some of the plastic pieces are broken, of course will need to be fixed, but you get the idea. The tank can be built to have the suspension flex with that of uneven terrain, which is something that's a nice touch specifically if you're building this tank for that of a diorama. Here we have the top deck. The pilot's cabin, which is, I believe, what it is called. Here we have here some more of the internal details. Here go, of course, that of the Maxim machine guns. Or I believe the specific term would be the MG-08, I presume. And other small little fittings for that of the Maxims and other little details that are found on the build. Here we have the main gun, which is found on the front. Again, very, very simplistic detailing. And really, it looks like my father pretty much built the whole tank, and we, all we have left in runner form is that of the tracks. Now, like I said before, the tracks are individual workable link. They were found on these runners, and the runners themselves are very flexible. They're made out of, they're cast in a very soft, flexible type rubbery plastic. All of the hinge pins are pre molded in, which is a nice touch specifically for the age of the tool link. To facilitate that of pinning the tracks together, the kit supplies you with these pre cut metal pins, which simply pin everything together. Here we have a small section of track that has been pre assembled. And even though the tooling is quite primitive, the tracks basically have their shape and detailing to them. And here you can see the flexibility and articulation found on the tracks. Now as for the model's instructions, Very, very primitive type illustrations, but they should be enough for the builder to get the idea. Now, in addition to this kit here, other kits that were released around the same time as this model here that also dealt with World War I era armor were the plastic kits from MHAR. MHAR is a British based company and also did a wide range of British pattern of World War I tanks. Such vehicles as the male, the female, as well as the whippet. All those vehicles have similar tooling to the ones found on this Toro Miles A7V here and at the time this kit here would be the type of tooling that one would expect from a smaller limited range company such as Toro. However, with that, as you can see, I have everything I have here in order to get the tank built. Starting with the model suspension, the suspension that you see here is all stock and supplied with the kit. Now, the kit was designed to have a somewhat functional form-fitting suspension. This was done via springs and a series of arms which would attach all three of these bogey pontoons to each other. Now, First, when it comes to accuracy, this is a very watered down version of the actual suspension that the A70 token cough had. Being based off of a Holt tractor, there would have been a lot more machinery that would have been located in this section here, and that is not present on this vintage kit. These details are present, however, on the more modern version from Meng. Now, as for the stock suspension here, like I said, it was all recycled from the kit offering. Now, unfortunately, due to the way these pieces were assembled originally, and also with the way they were bounced around in the box for, uh, for many years, the pieces did suffer some damage and, unfortunately, were not able to survive the salvage operation of the build. 
All of these pieces need to have been replaced in order to get the tank assembled. The stock pieces were replaced with new versions which were fabricated out of strips of styrene. The styrene strips were cut and shaped to identical specs as the original pieces. Because of that, once everything was assembled, some of the artic articulation did return. You can see the, some of the articulation here. In addition to the suspension, the track is also something that needs to be mentioned specifically for this build. Like I said before in the unboxing portion, the track is a workable track link system, which again, for the age of this kit is actually pretty interesting and definitely something that's forward thinking. Now, even though the pieces are functional, there is some caution that needs to be exhibited by the builder. Namely with the, and this comes with the way the tracks are molded. With the medium that they are made in, the, the Toro kit utilizes this flexible rubbery plastic type material for the track links. The issue comes with that the material can be very frail and fragile, specifically when it comes time to assembling the tracks. If the pieces are kinked or if they bend a certain way, the flexible rubbery plastic will rupture at the hinge portion which will just utterly ruin and destroy the link. Now fortunately the Toro kit does supply you with a ample amount of track links however there are a finite amount that are supplied with the kit so caution still needs to be exhibited by the builder. This is specifically true during the tracks assembly phase and also when it comes time to mounting it into the tank. Due to get the lack thereof any access into the upper spots and pontoon section over here. The track needs to be snaked in and bent around in a very similar way as it's done on the mouse. Now unfortunately this is where you can encounter some snags and bends with the piece when it comes time to wrap around the sprocket and the idler. So care must be exhibited by the builder during this phase of the build. Now I went ahead and checked and unfortunately there aren't any aftermarket track links on the, on the aftermarket scene that cater to the A7V Totenkopf. This is more likely subject to change and something might be coming out down the road from companies like Fruly Model or the other makers on the market. But currently there are nothing on the aftermarket scene for the A7V. So because of that, double caution needs to be exhibited by the builder when working with one of these old Toros. Now, when it, even on this build here, the track links were definitely something that were a concern of mine during the build as because of the state that the kit was in at the project start, it was uncertain if I still had any of the track links left as one or two of the links possibly could have been lost throughout the years and would have been unable to be to finish the tank without a full set of tracks. Fortunately, that wasn't the case and I was able to get the tank fully assembled with the kit supplied tracks. Moving from the suspension takes us to the hull detailing. Now, this vehicle is a pretty simplistic model in that there's not a whole lot of real features to talk about on the outside. But we'll start with first, the most noteworthy is that of the exhaust manifold. The A7V utilized two gas engines, and because of this, there are two exhaust stacks emitting from either side of the vehicle. The exhaust pieces are kit supplied, and of course, like with many of the other parts on this vehicle, are very, very basic in their overall detailing. However, the piece on the real vehicle was not very complicated in itself, so the kit version was utilized as it basically resembled the real one. Now, the only modification that I made was that of the end portion of the exhaust pipe. I went ahead and drilled it out as the kit version was molded solid. Of course, this was done with a Dremel bit at very slow speeds, and this is definitely a procedure where that does greatly help improve the look of the model, but is one that has to be done with caution as, like I often mention, you can easily melt away too much material and that can cause some issues. This, of course, is a mirror image on the opposite side of the model. Moving away from the exhaust takes us to the side hatches. There are two hatches on the side portions of the A7V. Now, the hatches were the simple kit ones that were mounted as is. However, one modification I made was to that of the small little handles that you see on the sides. The handles that were supplied with the kit were made of plastic and due to the clunky tooling of the molds are very problematic in trying to get them to be removed in one 
complete unit as they're easily broken and honestly with the amount of fiddling and cleaning required to get the handles off the runner and ready for installation it was simpler just to fabricate new ones from metal wire which is exactly what I did on this build. To make them out of wire I had to first partially drill the holes into the side of the tank as well as in the hatch. Now because this tank does have some interior detailing I did not drill all the way through and it's only part, part way into the material just enough for the metal to grab a hold of with the adhesive. This was done on both sides of the vehicle and these are really the only grab handles to be found on this type of tank. Now moving from the hatch you can see there are these small little hooks on the sides of the tank's front and back. These also were details that were supplied with the kit but again due to the clunky nature of the tooling they were not utilized and new ones were fabricated. The piece that you see here are fabricated out of thin pieces of wire which were flattened and then bent to the shape that you see here. Moving from the hooks takes us to the machine guns that are bristling all over this vehicle. Being a German World War I vehicle, the machine guns which would have been utilized would have been the MG-08, which was a Maxim pattern water-cooled machine gun, chambered in the 8mm Mauser round. Now, the units that you see on this model here were all kit supplied. The A7 V has a total of six of these MG-08s. The machine guns that you see on the model were again the kit supplied units and the kit supply ones are very basic in their detailing however they do have the basic general appearance of that of the MG-08. They were simply painted, weathered, and mounted to the model. Now one addition that I did make to the stock MG-08 was that I drilled out the muzzle ends of the flash suppressors that you see here and also on the back of the vehicle. This one here does not have its flash suppressor as it wasn't really molded into the piece. However, I have seen these machine guns with the flash suppressor absent, so it's not necessarily inaccurate. Drilling out these sections, again, are, are something that needs to be done with a lot of someone who has a lot of experience, and as well as the tooling, as just like with the exhaust, you can easily mess it up and will basically ruin the machine gun. If you do not have the tooling or the experience, just leave them as is, as it's better to do that as opposed to botch up a barrel drilling job. As for the paint, you cannot see it from this photo, from this view of the model as obviously this is the exterior view, but the machine gun's actually painted with two separate colors. The water jacket has this drab green color that is found on the surface and the receiver has its parkerized type coloring which can be seen if you look on the inside of the vehicle. Moving from the machine guns takes us to the tank's primary armament, which is that of its bow-mounted 57mm main gun. Now, the main gun that you see on the model here is deviating from the original kit. The piece you see here is made from a, from a composite of uh, some scratchable pieces as well as the original kit supply part. The barrel mechanism is the original kit supply component, however the rotor drum was a new piece that was fabricated. The reason for that was that the original pieces that I had with the model were misplaced during the model's rebuild and unfortunately because I was missing one of the halves I wasn't able to utilize the kit supply part. The original kit supply part was a two piece affair that when glued together a seam down the center would have to be contended with. Rather than trying to fabricate the other shell I simply replaced the rotor entirely with a tube component. As for the base for the component, I actually utilized one of my 1 6 scale German Tiger 1 S mine canisters. The S mine canister had the exact same circumference as the original Toro plastic rotor, so it was a perfect base to work off of to make the replacement piece. I built the piece to the same specs as the Toro one, adding the little slot for the vision slit, as well as adding the other components which were originally supplied for mounting the piece to the tank. Now the one piece that did, or the one feature I should say that did not be salvaged from the replacement of the rotor drum was that of the gun's elevation. However, the the road, the transverse I should say still works perfectly fine. The gun's interior was also slightly modified. The basic gun again was insanely simplistic and was void of a lot of detailing. One improvement I made was that I simply modified the breech end of the stock gun, adding some small 
hand sculpted piece of plastic to replicate that of the dropping breech block. The reason why I went to add these missing bits of detailing was that this portion here is visible if you look at through the top deck where there's grating on top of the model which allows you to have some partial view inside of the vehicle. This is why this detailing was added. Moving our way to the tank's roof takes us to the grills like I've just mentioned before. The grills on the top portion of this model are somewhat spacious in that you can't see into the vehicle. Now it is hard to do from the lighting that I have here but if the lighting is just right you do get a pretty decent view of what's going on interior wise with the detailing. Now this vehicle does have full interior detailing albeit a very basic and simplistic full interior detailing but it does have some interior detailing nonetheless. In the pictures that you could see that are flashing on the screen you will see the interior detailing that was built, painted, and weathered just prior to the model being all sealed up. Now, the interior is nothing really to write home about, but it, again, it is supplied with the kit, so why not go ahead and build it with the model. Now, when it comes to the interior color, this is one portion of the build that I've seen a lot of conflicting reports about, as there's no real documentation on what the actual color was of these things on the inside. The only surviving example of the A7 is that of the Mephesto, which is, was again captured by the Australians and is sitting in an Australian museum. Unfortunately, that vehicle was damaged when it was captured, and in addition to that, has spent the last hundred or so years being refurbished and repainted, so the interior color is not exactly left original. As for the color on this model here, I went ahead and utilized Red Oxide Primer and I went ahead and added the weathering accordingly. Now moving back to the exterior of the model, getting to the top plate, this is definitely something that needs to be brought up specifically when dealing with the original Toro kit. The fit of the panels on the original Toro kits are definitely not something that is the kit's high point and is something that many of the Toro kits have had comments about in the past. Keep in mind the tooling on this model is about 30 something years old so this would have been more contemporary for the time when it was released. With the, the tooling of today it is definitely far superior compared to the original Toro tooling. The Toro model the panels fit together but you will have a lot of hand fitting in order to contend with. Some panels, namely that of the sides, went together fairly well with not a whole lot of issues, but the top plate in particular was definitely something that was a boxing match. Trying to get the top plate to fit on and fit on without any gaps was a chore in patience. There were some gaps that were present, however luckily I was able to putty them up and remove them as much as possible in order to get the tank built to the specs that you see it here. What makes the A7V in particular something that this is an issue with has to do with the leading edges. The leading edges have rivet detailings molded on either side. Because of this, getting putty or even some thick type of super glue to go in and plug up these gaps is not something that you definitely want to be contending with and is going to be something more or less of a stress test. Luckily again I was able to get everything together and the model in my opinion went together fairly well for again being the type of tooling and the type of hand fitting required for something like this. Now if someone is used to the more current kits or if someone is one of those individuals who complained that the Dragon M103 heavy tank had some rough fitting issues, this is definitely a kit that they do not want to have sitting in their stash. Moving from the top deck takes us to the tank's helm, which sounds actually funny in that this is one of the only few tanks that I could think of that actually has a helm to it. The top helm was again the kit supplied versions and fit together actually almost perfectly. This is one of the better fitting parts of the entire kit. The vehicle does have some hatches that are found on these pieces however they are all molded and they are molded in the shut state. The only hatch that is a separate piece is that of this hatch over here with the grill on it and this hatch here is molded as a separate piece and you could mount it either in the open or closed state. Obviously on this build here I modeled it closed. 
Moving our way to the tank's camouflage and the markings, this is one portion of the build where it really spices up the model as honestly the A7 is not exactly a very interesting vehicle. If anything it has more of that medieval style siege tower type shape to it, but it, again it's basically a very simplistic vehicle as a whole. The camouflage is definitely something that can be added that greatly helps spruce up the vehicle compared to just leaving it with a solid color. As you can see, this model here utilizes a three-tone camouflage with segmenting black lines. The camouflage pattern that you see here was based off of the one that was in the Toro instruction sheet, along with the decals that you see mounted to the model. As for the decals, these decals are the original Toro supplied ones, and were surprisingly actually pretty good quality. Generally, when you're working on a vehicle of this age, and this era, specifically one from a smaller scale outfit, the decals tend to be more on the on the more lower quality end. They, I've had experiences in the past where decals would brittle up and break just by hitting the water. That surprisingly wasn't the case with the Toro. The decals went on with almost no issues whatsoever to talk about and they lacquered on and airbrushed over just like some of the higher end ones found on the more contemporary kits. Now the kit does give you two options for that of the decals and the option that I utilized was this version here which again was found with this camouflage pattern that was on the instruction sheet. Other than the camouflage pattern that the model got, as you can see I went ahead and painted certain parts different colors in order to make them pop as opposed to leaving them all with the continuity of the camouflage. This would be that of the painting of the gun and the rotor and also the painting of the lower chassis. As you can see I went ahead and left the lower chassis in its red oxide primer which again helps with this and the gun helps differentiate these pieces compared to the rest of the vehicle and definitely give it a little bit more interest compared to having it all follow with the same continuity. Overall, I'm really happy of the way the build turned out, specifically with the condition that this kit was in at the project start. Not to mention, it also feels great to finally have this model completed, on account that it has been sitting in the stash for about 20-something years. As for skill level and recommendation, due to the way the kit goes together with some of the sub-assemblies required, as well as the medium that comprises the tracks, and then the way the basic kit components fit together, I cannot recommend this build for a beginner or novice builder. Due to these issues, this is something that's really best left for someone who is has several builds under his belt, all the way up to an advanced builder. This model does seem a bit misleading in that the overall appearance does look very simple to do, however it does have a couple tricks up its sleeve that can catch you with your pants down if you're not knowing or if you are inexperienced with working with this type of hand fitting required for something like this. To add on with the difficulty that this kit does pose to the builder, the age of the model is also very apparent. Specifically on account that you can get a modern produced mang kit that is of the same vehicle type that is way more advanced in both interior and exterior detailing plus the fit and finish issues that this kit does have are not going to be nearly as present on the mang offering with the cost of the base starter kit it is somewhat cheaper than the offering from mang however with not too much more money you can get a model kit that's a lot better in quality something like this would be best acquired if you could get it for a really good bargain deal say at a model show or even like a auction on ebay now having said all that this model does build in my opinion into a very basic rendition of the a7v totenkopf Something like this is definitely recommended for someone who is an avid fan of early developmental armor, as well as World War I armor in general. This vehicle is also a great addition to anyone who is a fan of German tanks in general, as this is the first German tank ever to have seen combat. And it's funny how the Germans went from this, and within 20 years wound up with something like the King Tiger or even the Mouse. I also recommend this kit for anyone who is a collector of vintage model kits, as something like this would definitely fit into that type of oddball collection. Also, possibly someone who is into large-scale wargaming may be able to work with something like this, as 
It doesn't have nearly the amount of complexity as something like the Meng, but does give you a basic overall appearance of the A7V. If anyone is wondering out there who is thinking about finding one of these kits or may have one of these kits and decides to go off the deep end and try to super detail and correct it and make it as accurate as possible, this is definitely something that I don't recommend and is arguably might be a fool's errand as with the amount of work and effort put into something like this, it's still not going to be as good at the end of the day as the Meng offering. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale. German World War One A7V Tokenkopf tank. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook, where there are more photographs of this particular build that have been posted, along with many of the other smaller and larger scale builds that are posted on the ECA channel. In addition to that, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.